Good morning. Uh, this is the regional panel on Asia, the regional lightning panel. Um, Asia, or the Indo-Pacific as we often call it, is a vast and diverse and dynamic region. Uh, it's also China's neighborhood. But China's approach and engagement in this region has varied tremendously across the region. So to assess China's influence and impact on the different parts of the Indo-Pacific, we have three authoritative experts to share with us their insights on particular parts of Asia. Uh, let me introduce them briefly. Um, starting with to the west uh, with South Asia and to my left, we have uh, Susan Osterman, who's an assistant professor of global affairs and political science at the University of Notre Dame uh, and the Keough School of Global Affairs. She's the South, the South Asia Area Studies Specialist who has done extensive field research in Nepal, India, and Pakistan, and has been engaged in the region for nearly 25 years. She has a PhD in political science from the University of California, Berkeley, and a law degree from Stanford Law. And she focuses on policy-relevant research related to state capacity, regulatory compliance, and norm change. Uh, to my immediate left, I have uh, Richard Hedarian, who's a senior lecturer at the Asian Center at the University of the Philippines. Richard is a prolific writer, an academic, and policy advisor. He's currently um, uh, a senior lecturer, as I mentioned, at the University of the Philippines, and he is a columnist at a number of publications, including the Philippine Daily Inquirer, um, TV host at One News, and he's a regular contributor to many publications uh, across the globe. And he's written a number of books, to name just a few, the Rise of Duterte, A Populist Revolt Against Elitist Democracy in 2017, uh, The Indo-Pacific, Trump, China, and the New Global Struggle for Mastery in 2019, and he has a forthcoming book called Confronting China. And joining us virtually, we have Duveri Hanau, who's the founder and CEO of the Legacy Group, a geopolitical consulting firm. He is joining us from Papua New Guinea, uh, he has over 20 years of experience in advising governments, regional organizations, and foreign investors on geostrategy and political economy in Papua New Guinea and the Pacific region. Um, he specializes in trade aid for trade modalities, faith-based diplomacy, and technology investments. And he's had several important positions in Papua New Guinea, including his current uh, appointment on the Eminent Persons Group Foreign Policy Working Group, which is drafting Papua New Guinea's white paper foreign policy, and he has a law degree from the University of Papua New Guinea. So let me start by asking each of our panelists to give us an overview of their particular corner of Asia and how China is perceived and how China has approached countries in the region. So let me start with you, Susan, um, in South Asia. Uh, Sri Lanka is often considered the poster child of some of the negative consequences of a lot of Chinese engagement. Um, but there are a lot of other countries in the region. So can you uh, share with us your thoughts about China's role in the region and how it's viewed? Absolutely. And uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. And thank you for having me. Um, South Asia um, has had a really mixed record in terms of Belt and Road, but also Chinese engagement more generally. Everybody, I think, is familiar, both uh, those in the room uh, physically and those uh, present virtually, with the Sri Lanka example. Um, what many people don't know is that Pakistan is just a step behind. Um, and uh, with what's going on there in terms of debt unsustainability and the sheer quantity of lending is something like 64 billion at this point with additional projects being signed on to. Um, I think if we want to understand Chinese engagement in the region, we have to sort of look at um, Sri Lanka as the canary in the coal mine and uh, Pakistan is following shortly behind. There are the rest of the engagement in the region is quite varied. So um, for instance, Bhutan has no formal relations with China. Um, Nepal has made uh, quite a bit of uh, profitable strategic engagement between India and China by playing the two off of, off of each other. Um, and the Maldives recently um, has done the same, but actually has pivoted towards China. Um, so it's, it's going to be an interesting place to watch in, uh, in the near term. Thank you. Um, let me turn to you, Richard. Uh, Southeast Asia, 
you're from the Philippines and you've done a lot of work on the on Southeast Asia more broadly. Um, China's front yard, perhaps we can yeah. think of it. So, you know, in many ways, uh, it's it's really sort of the the, the core, the the central part of China's sphere of influence. Uh, we might want to think of it that way. So tell us about Southeast Asia and how China has approached the region and whether there are important differences between countries and how they perceive mm. China and Chinese engagement. Three minutes, right? <laughs> <laughs> this this yes. feels like a sports show. I was ready for a, kind of a stock market breakdown and wish this was a coffee. Um, very quickly, and some signposting things that I look forward to discuss later on with the panel. Mm -hmm. I mean, first of all, and this is kind of a preview of an upcoming book of mine with Melbourne University Press, First of all, what we're seeing is a kind of a 50 shades of hedging and agency as far as uh, Southeast Asia is concerned. I think uh, yesterday there was a lot of discussion about agency and strategic autonomy, et cetera, but clearly it's a spectral thing. You know, uh, When you talk about countries like Laos, for instance, their situation is tremendously different from a country like the Philippines, for instance. And Singapore, we had our good friend Bilhari also there. You know, They have also their own kind of degree of strategic agency and hedging. Now, speaking of hedging, of course, you know, it's, you know, I have my own ideas about this. We can discuss this later on. I, I believe there's also some limitation to how much hedging you can do, uh, or what I call strategic polyamory, right? <laughs> um, at some point, countries will have to make choices, because not making a choice is a choice in itself, and it has costs, and sometimes it's a privilege that some countries cannot afford. So I come from a country called the Philippines. We're very close to Taiwan. We're a US treaty ally. We cannot be neutral on issues like Taiwan, for instance, right? And what's happening there. So we're adjusting accordingly. And also what you see in the region is a wild swings, not only among countries, but within countries. I mean, I used to be here almost every month back in the day when Duterte was the president, <laughs> Trump was the president. I had one book on each of them. Now things are very, very different. And ironically, under Marcus Jr., which we all feared will be the next big dictator, but things have turned out very well, interestingly, in the right direction. But then again, you cannot say for sure what's going to happen to a country like the Philippines in the next coming years or after Marcus Jr. steps uh, down from office in 2020. So there's a lot of what I call strategic indeterminacy, right? That's why it's a very fluid picture. And speaking of fluidity, and this will be my last point because I think my three minutes is almost over. Um, I don't think the region is really bipolar. I find it intellectually impoverished when they say it's a US-China competition. If you look at the infrastructure development landscape, China has been engaging in what I call pledge trap, not debt trap. <laughs> a lot of pledges, and they get a lot of PR bang out of their imaginary buck. I mean, they're really good capitalists as far as PR is concerned. Um, in the Philippines, I mean, they offered 24 billion dollars in investments to Duterte. I'm still watching for a uh, hundred million to come in. It's, it's already 2024, <laughs> last time I checked. And you know, when Marcos went back there last year, they just repackaged the same thing minus the few millions that got in, right? Put a little bit of renewables here and there. Uh, it's actually Japan, which leads the infrastructure development picture. The metro underground system in Manila is being developed by Japan. If you look at Vietnam, Philippines, a lot of key countries in the region, Japan trounces China by far, even in terms of just pledges. So even in pledges, China is not necessarily ahead. So we tend to forget Japan, we, because it's a stealth power in many ways. Um, so I see the region more like, you know, my understanding of the region's geopolitics is like German politics. You have two dominant parties, SPD and uh, CSU and CDU, but the third parties, the smaller parties, can determine the direction of, of, of the flow. And that's why India is important, Japan is important, South Korea is important, and European partners who are getting more engaged in this part of the world are important. Thank you. Okay, let's turn to the Pacific, uh, Pacific Island countries. Um, Duveri, give us an overview. I mean, even within the Pacific, there's sort of three distinct uh, subregions um, with very different relationships with uh, China as well as other partners. Can you give us an overview of that region and how China's engagement in recent years has been viewed? <clears throat> So, 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 so just breaking it from, from that regional context, um, Micronesia, which is principally on the north, uh, has largely um, uh, been in the, in, the per, in the periphery of the U.S. through the, uh, the COFA and the COMPAC frameworks. And, and China has been sensitized to that, but it's also actively competing on its uh, BRI uh, initiatives and even bilateral initiatives. But if you shift further down south uh, to where PNG is, um, it's, it's a largely um, uh, uh, three-way play between Indonesia that has, um, um, it's now gaining more interest in the Melanesia uh, sub-region. 
um, principally that's been an Australian hegemony for the past 50 years. And of course, New Zealand has um, uh, several um, realm states that connect to metropolitan Wellington as well. So the conversation of China started picking up um, pr probably a couple of years prior to the BRI 1.0, um, and it started increasing towards 2010 on its infrastructure push. And, and, and Papua New Guinea was largely a major uh, a jewel in that, um, in that incentive. Um, again, I, I've been on several oversight committees, and the, the example that I give about uh, the differences on China approach is a three-page MOU worth $200 million versus a 1,000-page agreement from the ADB or one of the multilateral firms on infrastructure. That is basically the playbook that China brought practically into the Pacific. We weren't barred from norms uh, from Canberra, Wellington, uh, or, or even the multilaterals. Here was something completely different, where they offered um, significant resources. Uh, in most cases, they just bypassed state solicitors and went straight into mm. these agreements. So that level of attraction, that level of flexibility, even the enticements that uh, several speakers have mentioned about this uh, unlimited capital was where China started picking up. Um, I'll, I'll go into greater depth on wh wh where those uh, um, initiatives are beginning to uh, falter, beginning to pause, mm. and where they're beginning to change. But fundamentally, uh, the, 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 the pervasiveness of China going into all of the 14 island countries is quite um, impressive and disrupting uh, those um, hegemonies that existed. Again, what needs to be stated on the outset is America has been completely uh, absent in the region, apart from mm. PACOM and, and, uh, and those boats coming back and forth uh, traversing the region. But USG in particular uh, started um, uh, disconnecting from, from the Pacific, especially in the South, in the 1990s, and that's where... Um, conversations and other parties began to float within the leadership. And China provided that sort of opportunity that uh, started embracing um, national plans, regional systems. Fascinating. OK, we're definitely going to want to come back to some of those points that all of you have raised. Um, but let me start again with you, Susan. Sure. All of you have mentioned, um, I think, other important external partners so, and this point was made many times yesterday as well, that we should not view the Indo-Pacific as a bipolar rivalry between the United States and China, at least from the perceptive, perception of countries in the region. There are other very important actors at play. And Susan, in South Asia, obviously India is the big brother traditionally, um, very present, uh, very strong ties. So has India been able to regain any strategic ground as China has made big moves in its in India's own neighborhood, has it been able to step up? You know, its diplomatic engagement, its economic or, or security linkages. Um, how would you assess India's role in the region? And um, relatedly, uh, perhaps, uh, what are the challenges and prospects for India uh, for India's efforts to become uh, an alternative leading voice in the global south to China? So I do think that India is an alternative leading voice in the South to China, and it has been actually for a very long time, right, starting in the Cold War period with um, strategic non-alignment, right? Um, sure. That said, current Indian policy uh, tends to drive uh, neighbors into China's hands. Um, so India has been, um, India, moves from fear, right? Mm -hmm. um, if you want to understand a lot of the dynamics in the region, all you have to do is look at Google Maps and the sheer number of dotted lines between countries in the region and China. Um, India feels as if it's being encroached upon, encircled, et cetera, and um, it tends to make um, unreasonable demands of its uh, neighbors when it sees Chinese encroachment. So a good example of this is the 
a recent spat with the Maldives. Mm. Uh, you have a pro-China um, prime minister who has come into power, and um, all he had to do was make a few statements before India said, you know, essentially, if you're not our friend, then we don't need you anymore, right? And the Maldivians basically say, that's fine. We'll just go to China, right? That's not necessarily their best move. Um, but at the same time, this is something that has played out again and again. This happened with Nepal in 2015, the first time that there were um, fuel supplies sent over the Himalaya to Nepal was when India had a, a diplomatic row with Nepal, and Nepal simply turned to its north, right? Um, so I think that India is, um, is a viable alternative. I actually also see it as being pretty multipolar. Yeah. At the same time, I'm not sure that India is operating at full capacity at this point. I'm not sure they're making all of the right moves. Mm. Mm. Interesting. Uh, Richard, you mentioned uh, the multipolarity uh, in the region. Can you say a little more about, um, about that, how countries in Southeast Asia view other potential partners uh, compared to China? I mean, certainly you mentioned infrastructure. You know, China's Belt and Road and other initiatives in Southeast Asia have delivered a uh, tremendous amount of infrastructure. This has been very welcomed yeah. by many governments less delivery in the Philippines. Yeah. Um, but you know, how, how, do the, how do these countries view, and what are the interesting differences among countries, and how they view China's uh, you know, offers of infrastructure and other kinds of things? Uh, and then what are, what are, what are concrete ways that, that countries view other partners as alternatives? Well, I mean, yesterday we had folks from uh, Africa Barometer looking at very important data and numbers. I think in, in, in case of Southeast Asia, I mean, of course, we have the Pew surveys, uh, Gallup, among others, but I suggest really folks to check the Institute for Southeast Asian Studies mm -hmm. uh, annual surveys of influential folks. I mean, you know, they tend to ask the policymaker and thought leaders about their ideas about who are the most preferred partners, what are the pros and cons of that. I mean, consistently, we see Japan and, and the European Union coming on top mm -hmm. of others. I mean, there's there's strategic skepticism both towards China and the BRI, but also to a certain degree towards the United States. So if you look at the uh, views of the U.S., it increased significantly when Biden came into power, but now mm -hmm. things are tapering off a little mm -hmm. bit. So I think we have a lot of data and number that shows that not only countries do not see it as purely bipolar. They, they actively want other uh, players like Japan and the European Union to be involved here. Now, of course, as far as uh, you know, U.S. and its network of allies is concerned, then things can get more interesting, right? Mm -hmm. Because Japan can coordinate it with the United States. India sometimes can coordinate it with Japan and U.S. So in that sense, as much as China is very influential, I mean, I'm not being dismissive towards some of the big projects. I mean, they have very big profile projects, whether it's the railway, high-speed railway project in Laos, whether it's mm -hmm. the Bandung Jakarta, finally finished in Indonesia. <laughs> but, you know, they get a lot of bang out of that buck, right? That, mm -hmm. that limited but big ticket projects. But you see, we want other countries to be involved here. And we see that, for instance, India now is becoming a very big player on the defense front. Uh, mm -hmm. They're about to deploy the supersonic Brahmos missile system. Some of them have even Russian technological derivative mm -hmm. there. Uh, but the, the Indians just sent a very big delegation to the Philippines. So they're looking at Vietnam, they're looking at Philippines, they're looking at a number of countries in the region where they can build a big defense market. Well, what's important here is the shot of the future, right? So if we, ha we were to have this conversation three, four, five years ago, the assumption was China is going to overtake the United States by this time. So that mm -hmm. structured people's strategic moves and mm -hmm. expectations. Mm -hmm. Now that the discourse is not that China is going to collapse, but China is not going to really, you know, um, China's almost peaking, suddenly people are looking, oh, okay, who are the other rising powers? Like, and this is where India comes in. Mm -hmm. Or what are the other players that have not been as appreciated, even if they don't have that upward trajectory? Let's look at Europe, let's look at France, what they can offer. Or mm -hmm. South Koreans, who have been also very much on the upward trajectory. I mean, South Korea now is one of the largest mm -hmm. exporter of defense equipment, and a number of countries in the Middle East, whether it's Turkey, among others. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying here is that the strategic horizons of Southeast Asian countries have expanded, and they mm -hmm. actively want that expansion. And if mm -hmm. you look at the discussion in different capitals in the region, they don't sit down and say what US and China think. Mm -hmm. They're looking at how can we leverage our position mm -hmm. while we're building our capabilities. But the last point on this, my sense is I was in the ASEAN meetings and summits last year in Jakarta. My sense is, if you look at key countries like Indonesia, their understanding is time is on our side, actually, perhaps even more than, Indone uh, more than China. 
because demographically we're in a good position. Mm -hmm. We're all so since last year, several Asian countries are going faster than China, Philippines, Vietnam. Their idea is give us 10, 20, 30 years, we're all going to be full fledged middle power at the very least. And Indonesia may even vie for something bigger. So let's play it safe. Let's not do something crazy. Let's build our capacity, get everything from other side. And in 20 years, we're going to have interesting conversations with these big guys because we're going to be quite big ourselves. So clearly that applies to Indonesia. Clearly that applies to Vietnam and hopefully Philippines down the road. And it's very interesting that Indonesia um, snubbed the BRICS because it wants to join the club of OECD. Mm -hmm. So when a country as vital as Indonesia, third largest democracy, mm -hmm. uh, largest Muslim majority country says, no, I want to be in the club of OECD countries, that tells you about what deep inside they're thinking about. There are all of these conversations of anti-Western conversation, global South conversation, mm -hmm. but a lot of us actually we want to be part of OECD if you look at the key rising countries mm -hmm. in that part of the world. So that's where I think there's a lot of room for, for the West to come in and build constructive, good, forward-looking relationship. There is chip on our shoulders, because whether it's Philippines and Indonesia, we had certain interaction in the past, to put it mildly, which, which were not optimal. But it's not like the Chinese are doing a good job too, right? <laughs> By elbowing their way through. So I think now the field is open, it's exciting, mm -hmm. it's fluid. And that's why I find Southeast Asia quite an interesting part of the world. I used to you know, write a lot about the Middle East and other parts of the world. I was bored with ASEAN, but nowadays, <laughs> I think this is the sexiest part of the world as far as geopolitical <laughs> dynamism is concerned, yeah. <laughs> Very optimistic. Well, both of you, I think, have painted a picture of um, that's an important theme to highlight, which is the, uh, str the strategic agency of these countries mm -hmm. in dealing not only with China, but with other external partners and how they're very proactively looking to maximize their leverage mm -hmm. um, and pursue their interests. So let me turn to you, Devery, because you've made also a similar point. Um, uh, I don't know if the Pacific is as sexy as Richard's Southeast Asia, but beautiful. certainly most, <laughs> very beautiful. Most of, <laughs> the countries are much smaller. PNG is rather large relative to many of these very tiny nations uh, out spread out in the Pacific. Um, but you know, you also made the point in your opening remarks, and I, ho I, wish, I hope you can expand on those in terms of how countries have looked to things like creating national plans and you know uh, the absence of the United States beginning in the 1990s you mentioned and using that you know using that as opportunities to um, carve out new directions uh, in terms of their external engagements can you talk more about the approaches that countries in the Pacific have taken that have been effective or less effective yes certainly so so, so, so I think the first thing to, to jump into is um, uh, the government is 80% of everything. In mm. fact, in some cases, it's 99%. And the private sector, um, you know, hovers on the side. So, so, so capability building in the public service, um, first of all, uh, uh, changes the dynamics and approach on nation building. And so in, in, in the 90s and the 2000s, one of the success stories of Australian education, uh, soft power use with New Zealand and a certain extent, uh, you know, to the U.S. as well, was it, it built a cadre of um, MBA graduates. And then that uh, regenerated in, um, in the universities back in the Pacific. So, so that started creating um, a generation of national planners that uh, articulated that our development paradigm looks like this. We aspire to have that. We want to move in that direction. So um, prototype versions of those development plans in the mid-90s, uh, stimulated by um, multilateral programs such as the IMF, but indigenous plans started emerging in the 2000s. And that was where the intersection points started coming with um, regional uh, middle powers uh, and even the larger markets um, such as China, that he here is our playbook. This is what we want A, B, C, X, Y, Z type of projects to interface, support our supply chain, support our health services. Now, it wasn't all rosy. Um, I, I mentioned about those three-pager MOUs. That obviously fested into... Uh, local political dynamics, um, um, and, and, and largely the, the patronage that still prevails uh, in the Pacific, um, that's always a um, uh, uh, rubs against uh, democratic values. 
but but those national plans um, uh, uh, usually with a five-year cycle began to articulate much of um, what the national aspirations are. And um, for, for Papua New Guinea, for example, when we uh, became sexy, Richard, <laughs> when um, the world uh, started to come to our shores, um, and we must have had like 40 bilaterals, it was phenomenal. Um, right. And it was in that space you, you saw Prime Minister Marape uh, uh, put the, the medium plan in front of those his counterparts and leaders and say, this is what we want to do, this is our plan. So even when the friendship uh, dialogue of um, Nahendra Modi inviting uh, 10 Pacific Island uh, leaders um, and then the Americans um, piggybacked on that with uh, Defense Corporation and also Pacific Partnership Programs, you, you, you saw this level of consistency among Pacific Island leaders is, <clears throat> here's our national plan, here's our playbook. Um, where can you intersect? Where can you connect and partner? So that um, level of uh, maturity, um, it, it started um, also connecting into the regional architectural system. So mm. We have the blue uh, uh, um, Pacific uh, continent um, framework. It's, it's 10, 15 years. Those common issues on, on fisheries, on climate change, they also began to articulate in the bilateral. So it was as if an echo chamber was happening that whatever you heard from the region, elements of that would also articulate in the bilaterals as well. And so, so that was where we began to see um, a much more... Um, uh, collaborative China, wanting to listen to, to what these infrastructure mm -hmm. interests are. It, it's also reminiscent for me not to also uh, identify that um, because of America's uh, step up using Prime Minister Scott Morrison's term um, into the region, it bolstered the confidence of Australia to also come out on a, on a whole host of issues in uh, competing against the China um, uh, BRI and, and bilateral initiatives. Prior to the American uh, participation, um, uh, Australia had no capability whatsoever to uh, compete, and, and neither could New Zealand. And, and why would they? Because these are the uh, China is the largest trading partner, so so there, there had to be that level of um, uh, um, uh, um, yeah factored into their engagements. But, but, the, but the clear message here is um, what, what I'm observing now is that these national plans are becoming negotiating talking points. Uh, they, they are in many ways uh, stimulated through back end from Australian support programs, uh, regional support programs. But it, because they're indigenous in nature, um, it's creating that um, operational value on having some of those um, predecessor systems like the non-aligned thinking, the, the mobile staff thinking that we have our own issues um, and you're either going to partner with us or we're going to move on to the next. Mm. Thank you. Um, let me remind the audience that if you have questions for the panel, mm. please submit them uh, to askac.org. That's A-S-K-A-C.org. Uh, we'll try to turn to one or two at the, at, in a few minutes. Um, but let me ask, um, actually, Tavari, I'm going to stick with you um, and ask, uh, but I'm going to ask all of you um, what the United States and like-minded countries that are important in the region, uh, what advice would you have for U.S. officials as they think about how to improve, enhance their engagement in the region in ways that countries will find meaningful and might offset um, some of the negative impacts of rising Chinese influence. Devere, you mentioned that the United States has stepped up its efforts, has come back into the Pacific region uh, of, you know, over the last several years. Um, how would you assess U.S. efforts and what more um, or what types of engagement do you think would be most useful for U.S. Uh, officials to consider? Yeah. So, 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 so although USG has know, c come back into our, our neck of the woods. Um, it's also important to appreciate that uh, the presence of American values has remained uh, resiliently right throughout 
um, you know, prior to the, um, after the Second World War, through Christianity. So mm. a, a big toolkit that uh, Washington has over China is faith-based diplomacy. China does not have an equivalent. Mm. Um, when I speak to, um, you know, for example, James Marape, he's a devoted SDA. That's a concoction from America. Um, there are other um, very, very deeply pious uh, leaders in the Pacific that have those connections. So, th so that's a toolkit that the State Department um, you know, should utilize. Uh, I know of a delegation that uh, recently just went to the U.S. on the prayer breakfast. Th th these are connections that I think um, uh, adds uh, tremendous value in enhancing. Um, again, an example is uh, uh, John Maxwell is a, um, is a Christian motivational speaker. Mm -hmm. When he came to Papua New Guinea uh, 12 months ago, the entire cabinet attended you know, his speech. Almost the judiciary did the same as well. So, so, so this sort of um, uh, faith-based diplomacy is something worth pursuing. And again, America is 700% ahead of China in, in that space. Whether the State Department uh, subscribes to that, that's obviously another question. Um, the second thing is um, I, I, I'm a... a, a um, very interested in the way that AGOA connected um, Africa and the U.S. through very pragmatic uh, G2B connections. And, um, and a lot of great things came out of AGOA, the African Goods Opportunity Act. Um, I, I, I've helped construct European Union Pacific Economic Partnership frameworks, and it, it has a similar type of genre. But the difference that AGOA had was you were plugging American ingenuity investments right into um, African um, uh, resource bases. And there were some winners, some losers, of course. So a Pacific Agoa is, is definitely a, an area that I think um, America should explore um, because that type of genre is what is needed. We need the Googles and the Microsofts to help us in our digital uh, quest, digital journey. Um, we need um, Exxon's already in our backyard with a, with a, with a huge LNG project. So, so, so it's those sorts of things where you connect the nodes and pump our fish into the markets, n not just in America, but also within that West uh, sphere in, in, in Asia. And perhaps the final thing is just to circle back on what I mentioned about national plans. Um, and, and again, capitalizing on the previous speaker, from the uh, Institute of Republican Institute, um, apologies, I think I got that acronym wrong, but but his uh, the, the thrust of his conversation around democracy prevailing, these national plans are in many regards a, an indigenous definition of democracy, and this is where I feel uh, this is where I think much of um, U.S. support or, or its um, coalition support in, in the Pacific, investing in these national plans is definitely going to further increase democracy prevailing and certainly um, help um, that hegemony of values, of, of trade, of, um, of um, uh, open markets and free people prevail in an, in an increasingly you know, different um, uh, sphere that, uh, that China offers. Those are three, I think, really excellent points. And um, on the faith-based approach, I mean, there may be institutional constraints for the United States to uh, to use that at an, at an official government to government level. But it is worth noting that, I mean, you know, implicit in your remarks is that the Pacific is a very, you know, Christian, uh, devoutly Christian region. Um, and, uh, you know, voices that I heard when I traveled to the region were, were really emphasized that point and um, noted that Australia and New Zealand seem to have Fewer constraints, perhaps they they really u utilize that that channel of communication much more effectively um, than we do. But maybe it's worth thinking creatively about how we can um, boost some of those some of those engagements. Um, really excellent points. Okay, let me turn Susan to you. Talk about South Asia. I mean, the United States um, has not been you know perhaps as large a player as the two big countries in the region, India and, and China. But uh, what can the United States and other European uh, other Asian um, partners uh, do more effectively, or what would your advice be? 
So my advice uh, for the U.S. in particular, because I think European partners and uh, Japan in particular, uh, they have done quite a good job in the region. Um, for the U.S., I would suggest that we be more ideologically consistent mm. and, um, and in fact make sure that more of the assistance we give reaches the ground. So mm. emblematic of this is U.S. engagement in Pakistan, right? Um, we have a, a, a tremendous portion of the aid and other assistance we have given has gone to further our strategic goals, uh, and that involves sometimes giving, in fact, often giving aid to the Pakistani military. But then on the other hand, we sit there and criticize their democracy, right? Um, and it is the Pakistani military that has often overthrown democracy in this area. Despite that, I think your average person does still think relatively highly of the United States and the opportunities that it provides, but we're constantly tempering it with our actions, right? <laughs> um, just two years ago, when Imran Khan uh, was facing a no-confidence vote, he was alleging U.S. interference in, um, in that uh, sort of democratic process, right? And it's not that I actually believe that was true, it's that it did resonate to people on the ground that the U.S. would interfere in the region in that way. Um, so I would just, I would suggest um, more ideological consistency in the region. Great, okay, Richard. Um, uh, the United States in Southeast Asia, uh, there's been a lot of criticism of the lack, the sort of pulling back of a trade and commercial mm -hmm. diplomacy. Um, the administration, uh, the Biden administration has made some, some attempt to make up some ground with the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, IPEF. Um, but how would you assess uh, th their efforts so far? And you know, what would your advice be? And let me fold in a question from the audience, um, since we are running short on time, uh, which, which also is sort of relevant, because the United States approach to the region has focused heavily on ASEAN, I yeah. think, ASEAN engagement. You haven't really talked much about ASEAN in your remarks, but one of our audience members asks, um, can you speak to the role of ASEAN vis-a-vis -vis China and the US as a regional bloc and its approach to engagement with China? So is ASEAN, a useful, you know, platform for the United States to really focus on, or is it, you know, you've mentioned a lot of really uh, sexy countries, in your yeah. word, uh, that are rising. Um, is it, you know, do you think the bilateral approach might be more important? Yeah, Th thank you, 30 seconds. No, actually, I have ASEAN here. There's a reason why I didn't mention ASEAN. It's like, oh, I'm gonna get into hot waters and all. Um, you can check my latest Nikkei Asia piece on how we're trying to get around limitations of ASEAN. I mean, first of all, I think, um, it is true that just showing up is not enough, although sometimes even that doesn't happen. You have to bring something really forward. But as I said, we also have the pledge trap situation on the part of China. So our joke is that the IPF is America's version of a pledge trap or, or America doing it the ASEAN way, right? Oh. Like vague frameworks and then leave it down the road to deal with it. So I'm glad that there's that mutual strategic learning. Uh, in the meantime, <laughs> while we're figuring out what to do with you know all the structural constraints to market access issues and all. So I I think there's growing realism both in ASEAN and also in the US about what are the limitations, but let's work around that. But speaking of strategic learning, I mean, just look at, I just look at the relationship between my country and the United States. The past decade has been transformational. A decade ago, we were not even clear what, what does the mutual defense treaty really mean in the context of South China Sea. My God, we have moved. This is a quantum leap from where we were 10 years ago since I've been coming in and out throughout the years. And on the bilateral level, I think there's a lot of realism about imperfections of political system in the region. The, the, the democracies we have in the region, the TikTok populism we have. Mm -hmm. So there's, I think, more mutual understanding and respect that there was not there before, and, and nuances and, and subtlety in American diplomacy that perhaps was not there before for, for many reasons. I'm not here to point fingers. As far as ASEAN is concerned, um, ASEAN has all of its virtues, right? <laughs> we, ha we can have a long conversation about it. But as far as dealing with high stakes geopolitical issues like South China Sea is concerned, I'll say it again, it's just north of useless. Um, so um, that is where I believe mini-lateralism is the way forward. You know, Philippines and Va Vietnam working together uh, for a maritime agreement. Philippines, Indonesia, and Vietnam working uh, together on their own version of a code of conduct. The U.S. dealing with key countries in the ASEAN, I hate using that word because it's politically incorrect, key countries, but let's be honest. Like, you know, when you talk about South China Sea, when you talk about geopolitics in the region, it's Vietnam, Indonesia, Philippines, Singapore, those kinds of countries. I think there has to be 
an appreciation of limits of ASEAN, but also the huge potential of ASEAN minilateralism and minilaterally dealing with them. And lastly, I think there has to be also sometimes a, uh, honest conversations. Like, I know you guys, you don't want to make choices, you want to make the most out of this, but push comes to shove, right? Uh, who do you think is really the threat to you in the region? As, last time I checked, the U.S. doesn't have maritime territorial disputes with Vietnam, with the Philippines. My goodness, even the Indonesians have problems with China right now because their nine dash line is going all the way to North Natuna Sea. So that reality has to be reminded that you know uh, uh, China may sound more understanding and all of that, but you have some fundamental territorial and maritime issues that you don't have with us Americans. You can talk about what happened 100 or 50 years ago and all of that. That's important because I think the Global South, now I want to go back to our title, the Global South discourse is weaponized by China consistently to push their own version. But believe me, their understanding of multipolarity is not the same as us in ASEAN. For us, multipolarity is more agency, more room for conversation, an inclusive, pluralistic international order. China's version of multipolarity is post-American, more Pax Sinica. So we have to be absolutely clear about that and push back against the weaponization of the post-colonial discourse. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we are over time, so we have to close this panel. We could probably talk about the region all day, um, but we are out of our time. So I want to thank our panel and ask the audience to remain seated while the next panel gets seated. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. You. Yeah. thank you. Thank you. Thank you.